Jama Best, and I'm the executive director of the Arkansas Humanities Council. And um, I, I wish to welcome you and I'd let you know that uh, this is part of a series, which Ann is going to share a little bit about here in just a moment. Um, but uh, for those of you who has not jo joined us previously, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put those questions in the chat. And at the end of the evening, we'll um, uh, pose those questions to our panelists. And, uh, and so don't hesitate to uh, ask those questions that you may have. The public lecture series is one part of our We the People seminar. And the We the People seminar is funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, they're calling it a more perfect union grant. And we applied for the grant and we received it. So we have the public lecture series. We have a teacher nine-part teacher seminar series who all of the speakers tonight will be making individual presentations in that teacher seminar series in March and in April. We're thrilled to have them do two first for us, I guess, <laughs> is a good way to put that. And so David Ware is up on March 31st. Kay Goss is up on April 7th. And Ronnie Harris is up on April 26th. So for you teachers who are here tonight, I know there's a few of you that are here at the public lecture, you are gonna be hearing much more in depth about all of Arkansas's constitutions from these three constitutional scholars uh, as part of our teacher seminar series. The third part of our We the People series is a grant program for teachers that gives them up to $1,000 to do classroom projects or professional development that focus solely on uh, expanding their knowledge or doing classroom projects for their students in civics and social studies, democracy, anything that's related to constitutional ideals of the United States. And we've had several teachers apply for those grants and the grant period has closed, but we're in the process of awarding that money, the teachers are working on uh, those projects and hopefully we'll have some lesson plans that come from those projects that we're gonna be able to post on our Humanities Council website that all other teachers can learn from and use once those projects are completed. So that's what's coming up for March and April for the We The People. I am the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Arkansas Humanities Council. I've been here about a year and a half. And for those of you who have ideas, uh, projects, just want to chat about things that might interest uh, us here at the Humanities Council as far as promoting humanities education across the state. I'd love to hear from you. Now I have the privilege and honor of introducing our special guest. Kay Goss has been, um, she received uh, doctoral studies in public administration from West Virginia University. Also doctoral studies in American history at American University. Uh, she is author of a number of uh, books, including the Arkansas Constitutional Revision, Politics and Paradox. She was co-author with Walter Nunn, uh, which many of you I'm sure know. Uh, and then also, she was the author of the Arkansas Constitution, a reference guide in 1993. And as Ann mentioned before, she has worked with Arkansas state government for 17 years and including 12 years at the governor's office. Uh, mm -hmm. And she has also worked uh, on the federal level uh, for over 10 years as well. So we're, we're thrilled to have you with us this evening, uh, Kay. I'm very nice to be here. Well, we are so grateful. Um, our second guest that I would like to introduce you to is Dr. Rodney Harris. Uh, he's assistant professor of history and political science at William Baptist, Williams Baptist College uh, in Walnut Ridge. Uh, he received his PhD at the University of Arkansas, uh, where his dissertation was on uh, was about 1874 Arkansas Constitution. And I'm sure we'll hear some uh, information, uh, a, a lot of information about that 
um, tonight as well. So looking forward to that. Um, he also specializes in Southern and political history. He serves as the director of the Randolph County Heritage Museum in Pocahontas, Arkansas, and he's on the board of the Wings of Honor Museum in Walnut Ridge and the advisory board of the Hoxie First Stand Museum. Currently, he serves as vice chair of the Arkansas Review Board for Historic Preservation and a trustee of the Arkansas Historical Association. And I, I'd like to also add that he is, has been, he's written a number of grants uh, with the Arca through the Arkansas Humanities Council that were awarded and uh, some really good projects. And uh, so we're thrilled to have you as well with us this evening, Dr. Thank Harris. You. And then David Ware. <laughs> And then there's David Ware. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> David, <laughs> I've known David for many years and, and such a wonderful person. And I found out something new about him that he uh, is a collector of model trains. And I'm a huge train fan and model train fan too. So he and I are going to have to talk another time and not <laughs> this evening because the Constitution is a little bit more important than trains. So, uh, but I do uh, want to share that. Um, as Ann mentioned, he has uh, served as the state historian, director of the Arkansas State Archives, uh, also as of January 2021. Um, David has, Dr. Weir has spent over 18 years as historian of the Arkansas State Capitol, native of Washington, D.C., but he grew up in Nebraska and earned his Ph.D. in American history from Arizona State University. Uh, so, uh, uh, looking at our time, I'm going to go ahead, David, and turn this over to you, and, and thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Grant. Well, thank you, Jama and Ann, and thank everybody for having, for having Zoomed in. Um, I will confess that I'm not a moderator by training, and so I'll trip over my own shoelaces. Also, I'm going to, uh, there's quite an echo on my thing here, so I'm going, I may miss a few comments. Um, as I turn down my sound a bit. But I have um, actually a, a long list of questions and some would, some would be better uh, directed to Kay, some to Rodney. But let me start with a general one. What is a constitution supposed to do? What distinguishes it from the a state's code or, or statutes? What do we expect a constitution to be? I would say that a constitution should be that ultimate framework that governs the state, but that it should not be in such detail that that you go into minuscule items. <laughs> and so I'll add that, unfortunately, we've done that several times, but Kay may want to expound upon that. I agree with you totally, Rodney. And uh, the way I've originally found out that there was an Arkansas state constitution was that I had decided when I was eight years old that I wanted to be in public service, that I wanted to be a decision maker that helped people. And, uh, and rather than be a person who was just in the crowd, you know, and having other people make decisions for me. So when I went to the university as a freshman, I thought I need to take a course that will tell me something about Arkansas government. And I discovered there was actually a course in that and I enrolled in it. And that professor was Henry Alexander. He's, you know, he was treasurer of the Arkansas Historical Association for several decades. And then uh, he's now a permanent member. And when he passed away in 1969, but he introduced the subject of government in Arkansas by talking about the constitution. And he kind of made fun of it. Like uh, any of you own any Holford bonds? And we all we never heard of Holford bonds. No, no, no. Oh, I'm so relieved because you're, you were gonna lose all your money because they don't pay for those bonds. I mean, you know, and he would just, he would make absurd uh, comments like that, that caused us to, even though we were like, you know, 17, 18 years old, to kind of give second thought to it. And then he proceeded to organize his course around 
the various sections and then made fun of the amendments and all. But any anyway, just as a brief answer, it kind of formed the my framework for my future study. Uh -huh. Well, it's 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 a good story. You, you found you found you found a professor who who knew his material and um, pulled you into it. That's right. And we all be that lucky. Okay. Well, Arkansas has had five constitutions. What? One wasn't good enough for us? Um, our first constitution is adopted in 1836. And how would you characterize it? What were some of its features? Well, from a historical perspective, I would say it was, it fit right into the democratic impulse of the time. For instance, you didn't have to own property to vote. Mm -hmm. yeah, a big thing that stands out there. Uh, so it, it fits right into its time period in many ways. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we joined the same day, we joined the union the same day Michigan did. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at their constitution, it's a little bit different, but they are both very, uh, relatively speaking, permissive and okay. positive. Unlike some that would come later. <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> we have a lot of shell knots in the hundreds that have come, been proposed since. Uh, yes, indeed. So we have the 1836 Constitution. Would you say it stood alone or does it seem to be pretty, pretty, um, pretty much reminiscent of other constitutions of, of the early Republic? Yeah. It, yeah, uh, it was, and, and a lot of the provisions were kind of required, actually, at the time mm -hmm. to become a state. Yeah. And they were very much checking the boxes to gain admission as a state. Yeah. Right. In fact, I, I, I seem to recall something about how the Constitution was drafted before they had authorization to do so. There was some sort of chicanery involving an Ashley in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, look, looking for something suspicious, look for a member of the family. <laughs> okay. Okay, so 1836 Constitution gets us along until the onset of the late unpleasantness. And Arkansas in 1861 adopts another constitution. Uh, what sets it apart from its predecessor? Well, in, in many ways, they just go through and make some changes. Mm -hmm. so that we can join the Confederacy. But one of the most interesting things is that when you want to get rid of a governor, you go through and change the terms. What? So Arkansas wants rid of Governor Rector, so they change the election so they can elect a different governor. Okay. Uh, to me, that's what stands out there, that, that we're going to change just a few things, and then we're going to mm -hmm. shove this big one through to get rid of this guy that we see as trouble. Seems a long way around. They ever heard of <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant governors, that sort of thing. Or was there was there succession for the governor provided for in 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 the early constitutions? In case, I remember in case correctly, the, the president pro tem would have become the acting governor. Okay. There wasn't a lieutenant governor. No. Mm -hmm. Until later. Okay. So we have the 1861 the secession constitution. And then 1864, we get yet another constitution. What's the story on that? Well, okay. when you have presidential reconstruction, when Lincoln is still living, he's going to be gracious. He's going to be benevolent. Mm -hmm. So he's going to allow us to rejoin the union fairly easily. And so we draft this constitution for those purposes. Yeah. And so the changes were minimal? If, I, I'm not, I'm by no way an expert on 1864, but yes, fairly minimal there. It was to serve a purpose, to get us back in the union. Okay. Launching reconstruction. Mm -hmm. First round. Yes. And then yeah. we get to the it's second round. <laughs> Okay, so we, we, we have a, we, 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 um, 1868, we have yet another constitution adopted. Um, 
is it just an, is it just a tidy up of the previous ones or is it is, is it a more fundamentally changed document what you think <laughs> it was more imposed i think ah oh, well and it was radically different than any of the others mm -hmm. <laughs> much of the scholarship says that it's much more liberal in a sense we don't mm -hmm. confuse that with modern liberalism but much more liberal in a sense right permissive Permissive, yeah. that's that's the best word for that. Yeah, that's okay. right. Okay. It also is going to grant the government a lot of power when it comes to economic development and the economy in general. Mm -hmm. So actually having a, a, a relatively strong executive? Much more so than the 1874 would. Well, sure. <laughs> in fact, that there will be a response to that because they'll say that, that Governor um, Clayton was too powerful. Okay, I'm sure that would have that, that would have been a debatable point among some of his some of his supporters. <laughs> Should I say Charles W. Tankersley? But we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> okay, um, African Americans actually. Um, men had the um, had the vote in 1868 in Arkansas, did they not? Yes, that's correct. Um, so, um, were were there Afri any African American delegates to the to the convention that produced the document, and what role did they play? Well, there were eight African American delegates. Wow. Um, and as far as what role they played, there were a few who stood out. In particular, William Gray stands out. Mm -hmm as a spokesman for the group. He's often referred to as a spokesman for his race. He's a minister from Helena. Okay. And he had um, once been a servant for Governor Wise of Virginia. Now it's not clear whether he was a slave or whether he was a freedman who was hired as a servant. Mm -hmm. but he, had, had, he learned things under Wise that he would later use, let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. And what did what did, um what influence did he have on the on, on the the shaping of the document? Do you know? Thinking back, this is what I did my master's thesis on to some extent, and the the uh, eight African Americans, along with the so-called radicals of the convention, the radical Republicans, are going to be able to implement a much more northern oriented constitution when it comes to economic development and rights would be the way mm -hmm. I would phrase that. Would you agree with that, Kay? I do, absolutely. It, uh, as I read it, I, so my, large parts of it appealed to me greatly. <laughs> 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 I thought, ooh, why did we go back instead of arguing? Many of you will oh, remember yeah. Sandra Gordy at UCA. Yeah, and she always said that. Oh, if we could just live under that constitution, <laughs> I can vote for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so African Americans were in, were included to a degree in the drafting. Who got left out? Who didn't former, show up for the party? Former Confederates. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> now there were a few that got through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, what what effect did this have on the shaping of the Constitution? Well, for 1868, it has very little effect on the on the Constitution making itself, because Southern conservatives chose to set it out for the most part and not even try. Mm -hmm. That allowed them to later say this was imposed upon us. Right. Okay, which then leads us to that golden era of the 1870s, um, Arkansas's very own second civil war, um, a, a, an unpleasantness just in time, which leads, of course, to the, constitu the Constitution of 1874, which is where, where we end up where we are today, right? <laughs> um, the 1874 Constitution has been called many things. Um, the term that uh, is most common is uh, Redeemer Constitution. 
What's this Redeemer business about anyway? Well, as I tell my students, think of it almost in a biblical sense that Southerners thought they were redeeming or taking back what was theirs. Okay. They're kicking out those, the damn Yankees and keeping what was theirs. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Had they gotten the right to vote back? Yes. S sneaky devils. <laughs> <laughs> By that point, they'd gotten the right to vote back and had recaptured the governor's office. Uh, yes. <laughs> and control the governor. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, 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 I remember telling my students in Arkansas history that Brooks-Baxter War consists of wings of the Republican Party punching, and punching out each other in the streets of Little Rock and the, and the Democrats sitting back and enjoying the show with popcorn. <laughs> Pretty good way to put that. Mm. But um, so we get in 1874, we have a constitutional crisis. We have violence in the streets. We have shooting down at the Anthony House. Um, as far as I know, Lady Baxter is not, is not shot off. And at the end, we have a, const a constitution that differs significantly from the 1868 constitution, yes? Yes. In what ways? Um, does it differ? You know, let me count the ways, right? <laughs> One of the most striking ways is that it, it creates an extremely weak governor's office. Mm -hmm. Now, why was that? Other than Powell Clayton. <laughs> it's mainly a response to Powell Clayton, I would argue. Yeah. Right. And his perceived and abuses of governor. power. Was that Kay? I just said reconstruction governors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. in general. Mm -hmm. Pal Clayton, <laughs> example. Yeah. Well, what is it? Um, as I recall, it also gets rid of the office of lieutenant governor, doesn't it? It doesn't include it. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> we had to do that later. True. And then it was delayed by a few years. Yes. Few decades. Okay, okay. but um, no the 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 1874 Constitution. I'm sorry for this echo. I've tried disconnecting my speakers and everything else, and my phone is halfway across the room. And what can I say? <laughs> it's, it's it's okay. The, it's okay. It's the ghost of William Jennings Bryan echoing my every word. <laughs> okay, you've you've characterized. Um, at least the 36 and the 1864 Constitution is permissive documents. Um, the 1874 Constitution, not so much, right? It's a kind of a thou shalt not rather than you go ahead document. Yeah, I look at it as a limitation document, mm -hmm. curbing your freedom, really, in a way. <laughs> You know, when you force governors to have two-year terms yeah. after they've gone through that first session of the legislature, mm -hmm. they start thinking about running again for re-election. Yes. And um, I, I thought when I studied that, that, well, that, that keeps them in touch with the people, but working in the governor's office, it felt different than that mm -hmm. because you were rather than governing and rather than implementing the legislation that had been passed, you were framing your campaign themes and that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, Essentially coming back in, having no, no time to do the real work because right. done, with, done with one campaign, getting up for the next one. That's exactly how it felt. Ish. The staffer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have we have something that it it is a limiting constitution. Um, if the governor doesn't have the power, who gets the power in the Constitution of seventy four? Well, in many ways, the eighteen seventy four Constitution transfers as much power as possible to the county government. Okay. 
It creates incredibly powerful county government units. Okay. What was the idea oh, behind it? Oh, excuse me. Sorry. County judges, uh, Rodney, I think had really executive, to some extent, legislative and judicial powers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's also true in the commission form of city government. Oh. The commissioners together, three commissioners have all those powers. So it was not an actual check and balance like we right. talk about for the national government. Mm -hmm. Now constitution makers would argue that they were placing power closer to the people. Right. Okay. But in reality, they were trying to protect elites as well at the local level mm -hmm. and make sure that power stayed in the hands of local elites. Uh huh. Yeah. Local elites. Are, hang on a second. I'm trying. I'm trying to adjust my microphone here to see if I can bring the volume down. Unfortunately. Oh goodness gracious! Technology make it. It makes something of us all. I mean, it's just fine, really. Okay. Sorry. Okay. My, well, my, my, my thought is if, if county judges were any closer to the people, does that necessarily make them any more trustworthy? Back then, of course, not speaking of today's <laughs> exemplars. This is history, folks. This is not, this is not current events. It's about personalities, <laughs> concepts. <laughs> That's a great question. Mm -hmm. You know the, the the old idea that if someone if someone wants office badly enough to seek it, um, that in, that's an indication they couldn't be trusted. <laughs> well, you know, it depended on the person more than it did the provisions in the Constitution, I think. Mm -hmm. But usually, uh, county judges, even you know, in the seventies and eighties and nineties, when I was uh, running all over the state, trying to bring everybody together all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, county judges were the people that you would go to to influence political outcomes. Right. And almost every one of them, there were a few notable exceptions, but almost every one of them were big collaborators, very articulate, you know, hail fellow, well met. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, all men. Yeah. Um, and they were financially able to run for that office and serve mm -hmm. because they were limited, you know, to making $5,000 a year. I never will forget, Dr. Alexander came down and was testifying to the Constitutional Revision Study Commission in 1967. And he was talking about the limitation on salaries and how that could and should be increased. And uh, <laughs> Sheriff Roy, uh, Sheriff Moore, Dorothy Moore's husband, okay. um, was sitting there and he was also getting ready to testify. And I made some uh, comment, just a brief comment about the low salaries and it was a shame. And, and he said, well, don't worry about me. I make more than all the other sheriffs combined, which sent me as a student, you know, kind of scurrying to figure out how in the world is he making money? And so it turned out the way he was making money is the county sheriff was also in charge of the county jail and he could charge the county for the meals he served the prisoners. <laughs> and uh, so that was how he was making his money. He would buy the groceries that would cost less than he was charging mm -hmm. the county. Well, you, touch was, on, you know, oh my God. Yeah. You touch on salaries. And one of the things about 1874 that never has made sense to me because it should never happen is we spell out the salaries in the original constitution. Mm -hmm. It sets the governor's salary. It sets every salary. And so what that means is that every time you want to give the governor a raise, you have to have a constitutional amendment. Yep. Of course, that's part of the secret of how we get to 102 
constitutional amendments. But as a child, I remember that the governor of Arkansas made in the 20s. Mm -hmm. and Bill Clinton made, what, 25,000? 25, you know, which no one would want that job for that kind of money today. Mm -hmm. Dale Bumpers once made the comment that uh, when he got paid, this he got paid 10,000 a year. When he got paid, that he put his check out on the table. And Liza was the cook at the mansion. And he said, Liza quit the other day because she saw her, his check and thought it was hers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and cut in half or something. <laughs> and yet there are some who, who call for a return to the principle of of starving the politicians here. That's right. <laughs> it wouldn't be that cruel. <laughs> okay. Rodney, you, you, you alluded to something we're going to talk about later, the plethora, the, 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 the overflowing horn of plenty of amendments. Um, what about amendment number one? And Kay, um, Professor Alexander referred to it. <laughs> Um, what is the what is the idea behind amendment number one? I I, I like I I I like to draw people's attention to this one. <laughs> right. Can we say Holford, Bob? That's, that's yours, Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, she's forgotten why she shouldn't be a. Well, you're going to have to refresh <laughs> my memory yeah. on what amendment one is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was um, the fish the fishback amendment. Okay. So yes. repudiating yeah. the bonds. Exactly. You know, when, when your first constitutional amendment allow, allows the state to more or less legally Welsh on a debt, right. <laughs> this does not bode well. <laughs> no, and this is an ongoing saga that begins back in 1836, though. Mm -hmm. So prior to the 1836 Constitution, banks weren't even allowed in Arkansas. And there's this great story about a guy basically having the equivalent of a check and having to go by boat to New Orleans to, to cash it mm -hmm. before we became a state. So our answer is we'll create two state monopoly banks and, and all the politicians will own stake in them. And so you can imagine how that went. Mm -hmm. And so these, these Holford bonds and this later bond is all rolled over. And so it's this ongoing saga. Mm -hmm. And men like Fishback just didn't see why we should have to pay it. Mm -hmm. um, in the modern age, you can imagine the creditors calling the Capitol building, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yes. But yes, it sets that. the tone for Arkansas's government for years to come. <laughs> it means we can't go borrow money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, kept us poor but honest, right? <laughs> kept us <Okay>. poor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we have the Constitution of 1874, the Thou Shalt Not Constitution, guiding the state as it manages to emerge from, uh, um, uh, managing to sort of emerge from being a southern impoverished backwater up to the point where by the turn of the century, we can almost afford to build a new capital. And no, I'm going to save that lecture for another time. Right, Anne? Yeah. <laughs> or several lectures. Um, but... Surely there, would, there should have been people, especially during what we turn the progressive era, who thought that maybe the Constitution needed an overhaul. Uh, so we, 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 have, um, we, we, we have, I believe, um, an, an attempt early in the 20th century to draft a new Constitution. What comes of that? Well, we had a period of probably 20 years where people really thought about that on a regular basis and campaigned for it and against mm -hmm. it. And uh, newspapers covered it. And uh, uh, it was, <laughs> it, people teased me because, you know, I'd served as research assistant to the Constitutional Revision Study Commission. And then I was mm -hmm. research director for the Arkansas Constitutional Convention in 79. 80 and then um, I had my doctoral dissertation topic was why did the people of Arkansas um, 
defeat the constitution that was proposed in 1970, but pass the constitution in 1980. And when both failed, <laughs> my professor and I kind of threw up our hands and said, <laughs> nobody's interested in why Arkansas defeated both constitutions. So, uh, and, and maybe Rodney studied that, <laughs> but uh, it was kind of sad for me. Well, we've had what, Rodney? There was a constitution. Wasn't there a constitutional convention back in Bruff's administration or an attempt at one? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and they, wrote, had... they worked on a very progressive document. Uh -huh. um, and and I kind of argue that when it failed, it disillusioned a whole generation of progressives in many ways. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because I mean, they saw that as a golden moment there. Mm -hmm. It should have been in many ways. Right. Yeah. So we have this one, then we have we have two more constitutional conventions. Are there some that I've missed? But three in the 20th century that I know of. So you have what 1970? Right. And 1980. Mm -hmm. And then you have a call for a convention in 92, I believe, or in the early 90s that didn't make. Okay. And they tried, you know, in uh, 1975, they got some legislation for a convention and it didn't happen. I'm trying to think there was some kind of legal um, argument with the way it was framed. Mm -hmm. Didn't they try when Faubus was governor as well, that that one didn't go anywhere either? I mean, they tried to call for a constitutional convention, but that didn't go anywhere. I believe there was some discussion around Central High and the crisis mm -hmm. about maybe, it, but I don't know how far that went. Okay, I'm just, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm recalling David Pryor when he was the state rep being involved. Oh Paul. yeah, that's right. So yeah. David Pryor's initiative was geared toward improving county government. Okay. Make it more, um, open to the public, more um, divided among executive, legislative, judicial, uh, rather than putting it all under the judge. And all so many of the titles of county officials were actually judicial titles, you know, rather than executive titles. The quorum court and the county judge mm -hmm. and so on. You know, it's still, it's still, Surprise me though. Why do these? Why do all of these attempts to to draft a constitution that's more or less up to date? What what is there a common factor that makes them fail? Why do why do these doc these attempts stiff? Well, we always thought that the reason the seventy constitution and the eighty constitution failed was that it provided a number of routes for raising taxes. Ah. Mm -hmm. and took the limits off, you know, in order to raise the state income tax, you have to get a three-fourths vote in the legislature. Right. And if there's and one so word that everybody describes... uses the sales tax because it's easier. Right. If there's one word that describes the 1874 Constitution, it's retrenchment, and that we're not going to raise taxes, we're not going to spend money, <laughs> and so, you know, we ain't a gonna, ain't a gonna, unless right. we're amended to let us do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we can't get a new constitution. You know, we can't, we can't trade the Tin Lizzie in on the 36 Ford. So we amend the sucker to death. Yeah. You said how many, how many of them is Rodney? I think it's 102 at the moment. That's right. Yeah. 102. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But when I was reading uh, in advance of our uh, session tonight, I was astounded to find that there had been 43 amendments that had been proposed to the, for the legislature at the beginning of their session. And they can only propose three. Legislators can't go beyond that. <laughs> How could they choose? <laughs> I mean, some state senators got to propose two. <laughs> Wait a minute, double dipping? <laughs> okay. Okay. So basically, to, to, to go beyond 1874, you have to amend, you have to tack something onto the tail 
of the Constitution. What, what effect does this have on the, the shape of governance in Arkansas, shape, shape of lawmaking? Well, my theory is that there are so many amendments that we have to have more amendments to correct those as times mm -hmm. change or as political philosophies change. Yeah. It just, it, gener it generates itself, its own self. Mm -hmm. And it also opens the door to troublesome amendments in a sense. I'll, I'll give you an example. I hate to give such a contemporary example, but I think it's the, the best one. The casino amendment that allows casinos in uh, Mississippi County, Polk County, Garland County, and Jefferson. How did they choose for it? Well, and, and, and they're enshrining in the document itself just four counties out of 75 that can have casinos. Right. That seems problematic to me. Mm -hmm. it, it's back to like the salaries, you know, you're... <laughs> right. So but if the people nice... in White County want to start a casino, they have to get their own amendment. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, it's it's constitutional because by George, it's an amendment. It's it's not one of those laws right. that overturn. Right. So so in a way, legislation by by amendment, it's it's the instrument of choice for people who want to make sure that somebody doesn't come behind them and mess things up. Well, and then a lot of work. <laughs> you open the door to one of the amendments that Kay has referenced. One of the forty whatever mm -hmm. is one to make a, the initiative process more difficult mm -hmm. so that if you or I want to get something put on the ballot and collect signatures for it, we would have to get a 60% of the vote under a proposed amendment rather than a 50% mm -hmm. because those people in power want to secure what's there and make it harder to amend. The ghosts of George Donaghy and William Jennings Bryan should be turning over in the graves at the very idea. <laughs> So did that make that did that one make it make it past the, the, the guards or has it been consigned? I'm not sure now? that it has. I see where there's a coalition that's developed to fight it. So they must think it's going to. Okay. Well that's that's one issue. The gambling is another. What sorts of issues, you know, for, for the for those who haven't actually sat and, and gone through the amendments, what sorts of issues are addressed by amendments? Well. Salaries. For salaries. One. Yeah. I guess we no longer have to do that with the new salary commission. Exactly. We, we fixed that problem finally. Is that, is that the uh, Independent yeah. Citizens Commission? Uh, is that I don't remember what it's called. I, th I think that is. Yeah. That, that they go along and raise the salaries every so often. Right. The one that stands out in my mind is term limits. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, in 92, we passed term limits, and the, the idea is that we're going to get rid of these old heads that have dominated things forever. Mm -hmm. And then every legislative session, the new folks want to find a way to extend their term limits. <laughs> <laughs> the very same people who argued we've got to get rid of these entrenched people are now saying, we need my experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> Not all pigs are equal. So. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> well, there's this 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 might follow on with that. Um, what's the best argument either of you have ever heard for revising an Arkansas constitutional provision? Well, I've already told mine, and that's the one mm -hmm. about uh, Governor Bumpers and Liza right. that the mm -hmm. governor's mentioned. Uh, it, one of the funnier uh, experiences I had was uh, during the Constitutional Revision Study Commission, we were talking about salaries mm -hmm. and Governor Winthrop Rockefeller came to testify. And uh, so he was talking about the need to raise the salary and, and one of the commissioners said, you know, what do you think it should be raised to? And he turned to Tom Isley and he said, Tom, uh, what is my salary? <laughs> And uh, so Tom said, uh, Governor, it's 10000 a year. And he said, Tom, I said my salary. 
<laughs> and Tom said, well, it's, Governor, it's 10000 a year. He said, my God, Nels makes, his brother Nelson was governor of New York. He said, Nels makes 75000 <laughs> 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 so Anyway, he said, we should increase that. Mm -hmm. And he said, why put the salary in the Constitution? And everybody thought, oh, you know, that was radical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These people that become governors might become rich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Legally. <laughs> yes. Well, I think one of the bigger changes we made that's a positive is moving the governor's uh, term from two years to four years. Yes. And Kay alluded to that earlier. Mm -hmm. But I mean, by the time you've you've been there two years, you're just learning to govern. That's right. You're, you're just learning elected. The and the agencies and the people in the agencies. Right. right. And what they're what they bring to you in the way of challenges and problems and how to solve them. Mm -hmm. And I then think some of our efforts to limit terms and do things like that have empowered a bureaucracy too that has become more powerful than the elected officials themselves. That's so true. Mm -hmm. Henry Gray was our guy who was so powerful who would just tell governors, you know, forget it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> now we, we've talked we've talked about um, an, an initiative and of course referendum in which the legislature gets to say hot potato over to you guys. Right. Um, the popular democracy measures that were brought in with an idea of um, bringing a new wind into the into the halls of the Capitol building in the early 20th century. How have these provisions been used, misused, abused? What's the what's the popular the popular democracy track record in Arkansas like? Well, one of the ways that, I don't know if I would call it misuse, but it's not used in the way it was initially intended is outside groups coming in and leading petition drives and getting things placed on the ballot. So, you know, in a negative sense, you would hear that called dark money coming in to do that, you know, so that has been a negative to some extent. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think? Well, I, I have not seen that so much because of being in D.C. in the last 20, 29 years. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an interesting thing that's been pushed for years, and I have a very quick story. <clears throat> so before I became an academic, I was very involved in Republican politics. And for years, the Republican Party had pushed for an amendment for a recall provision. Mm -hmm. And in 2012, I served on the platform committee and a state legislator who shall not be named, but basically dominated the floor. And he said, we're going to be in power after this election. So we don't want any recall anymore. So let's nix that. <laughs> An honest man. <laughs> you know, so they were, they were very comfortable with recall if they could recall a Democrat. They weren't so comfortable if you could recall a Republican. And I'm sure that would go the other way as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No doubt. <laughs> That's fun. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, you know, my, my, my thought is that the, um, that the, initi the initiative system has engendered a lot of temporary work for people uh, checking checking the petitions, yes. uh, checking signatures and so forth, um, probably occasioned a fair number of eyeglass prescriptions being revised too, right. on the part of my former colleagues in the Secretary of State's office. But it, it, it doesn't seem to be the, it doesn't seem to have proved out quite the way it's, its advocates had hoped in the early part of the 20th century. And the referendum part has given legislators a lot of cover. Yes. So that they don't have to pass a tax. Mm -hmm. They can all sign their pledge that they'll never raise a tax, and then they can throw it to the voters and say, but if you want a good road, you got to vote for a tax. Right. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but only for roads of four lanes, right? That's right. <laughs> and leave the court to sort that one out. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that that you know the the, the story of of, part, of parsing the measure and deciding that roads of more than four lanes weren't covered 
um, brings me back to a, a, a question of the specificity of many of the measures, especially the amendments to the Constitution. And long term, long term, is it good for government to have such specific and sort of nitpicking things written into the fundamental document? By doing so, it makes the document cumbersome and hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. The Arkansas Constitution has never been a document that responds to a crisis well. <laughs> <laughs> like if you've it. got to wait for two years to amend it to, to deal with the crisis, it, you know, you aren't doing very well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So question for both of you, what do you think the prospects are for say in the next 20 years or so, a serious effort being made to rewrite the constitution, to, to, to adopt a new one, basically get a 20th century document in place. I think it would take a governor who uh, has a lot of heavy support, not just barely uh, getting elected mm -hmm. and putting that as the number one issue. And, yeah. show, and being willing to talk to people county by county around the state mm -hmm. uh, and uh, make it a priority to try mm -hmm. to bring the whole package together. Mm -hmm. I agree with Kay on that. I would also say that in our current political climate, I'm not sure that, that we would get any more of a um, forward thinking document than we already have. Right. <laughs> I agree with Rodney. Oh. Absolutely. It was a very delicate way to put that, Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was perfect. Well, you know, if but imagine yourself in the in this in this the election cycle, this this governor with broad broad support, maybe even a few voters from the the opposing party, decides a constitution is a good idea. How does he or she? best sell the idea what 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 would what would be easy to sell to the people as reasons to have a new constitution well i'm going to say something that may be considered kind of sacrilegious about that because i totally good. believe that if governor hutchinson wanted to have a new state constitution he could probably do that maybe it's too late in his term now mm -hmm. but you know, he could have done that. I think Mike Beebe could have done that. But yeah. I don't know any of the other governors that maybe could have done that. I definitely think that prior to the pandemic, if Governor Hutchinson had wanted a constitution, he could have probably done that. Mm -hmm. And in Governor Beebe's first term, I think he could have done that probably That's as right. well. That first term. Yeah. By the second term, the political climate was changing. So that might not have worked, but I, I think both of them had such a mandate. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps the next governor will, will feel the urge. Now, one thing that, um, you know, we've, 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 we've talked about the, um, the, the constitutional amendments that have been adopted. What, um, what about the ones that didn't make it, the ones that thankfully got away? Um, do you have any particular favorites in the thank God and Greyhound are gone department? I can't, I, 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 we talked about this question the other day in our planning session and I, I've looked back through and I can't come up with specific examples, but what I will say for, for all of my criticism of the many past amendments, the voters have been pretty good about straining out the negative amendments. Mm -hmm. Arkansas voters have, have done a good job at that overall. <laughs> it's remarkable. I'm glad you pointed that out because there have been some kind of uh, off the wall <laughs> ideas, you know, but they haven't gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, they're just waiting to come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they often do. <laughs> <laughs> OK. 
Okay. So at this point, I I'd like to ask my, my, my colleagues here, um, with whom I would really rather be sitting in a room with, some, with a comfortable beverage talking, because you great company. I hate to say this, even if you're back in my hometown, it's a great company. <laughs> um, but do you have any final thoughts before before we open up the open up the chat line for questions? Do you have any thoughts about the Constitution and what the the legacy of those framers of '74 has been? Make nice. <laughs> well, you know, I think that it's easy for us in our day and time to look back and to criticize them. But I think they were doing the best they could do in their own time. And so I don't look down on them or begrudge them. I differ, I disagree with them somewhat from time to time. <laughs> and, I, and it's really frustrating to see some of the limitations that were placed. Mm -hmm. But um, I, don't, I don't have negative thoughts about the, those framers. I, one of the things that stands out to me is for whatever reason, there seems to be this perceived idea. Of course, if you say we need an international constitution, you really get people up in arms very quickly. But many people will say the same about the state constitution. And if you look at state constitutional histories across the board, most states have had multiple constitutions and you have to tweak those every now and then mm -hmm. to meet the modern day. And the fact that we have failed to do that just is mind boggling to me. And I think it has helped us stay behind. Yeah. And I don't know that there's a path out of that without broad um, public support. Yeah. So. Absent broad public support, Professor Harris, the answer is more amendments. More amendments <laughs> of the right kind. Well, let me add one last thing. Um, so I like to point out that in 1874, Democrats controlled everything. And, and as we all know, Democrats controlled everything in Arkansas for a number of years. And unlike many Southern states, we didn't go through a gradual process. It was just like we flipped a switch and now Republicans control everything. Mm -hmm. So we've maintained this one party structure for so long. And I think until you have an active two party structure, it's going to be hard to get a new constitution. Mm -hmm. Because a one party state suppresses voter participation because if you already know the outcome, then why participate? Yeah. So. Yeah. Do we need the shade of Winthrop Rockefeller to come back and throw another party for two parties? That would be very interesting. And having worked for his son, that would have been wonderful, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. His grandson's doing well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Well, let me take a look through the chat line here and see if there are any questions. Aha! How many states besides Arkansas have an initiative and referendum process? 17. <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. So, you know, I was surprised with that number because I would have thought by now that's such a enticing kind of provision that uh, it would be more mm -hmm. than the only total of 18. And what's interesting about that is in that sense, that puts Arkansas in a more progressive column in some way uh -huh. than we usually uh -huh. think of as, ourselves yeah. as being. <laughs> exactly. I can't remember, did, it, did any states adopt recall? Wisconsin has recall, California. Yeah, they'd used Remember it. Remember Arnold? Oh, that's right. Or they didn't use it. They voted against it. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. Pollsters have the hardest time uh, getting that, getting true data on how people are going to vote in a recall. Mm -hmm. They were off about 25% on, on Governor Newsom. Wow. You get a, a divided question in itself. You have to vote yes for the recall, and then you have to choose who you would want to be governor if it were to pass. 
Right. So it, it's hard to wrap your mind around if you're a voter, I think, even. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can complain okay. about them all you want, but actually voting them out of office, that's serious business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's see here. Um, one question we have we have a comment uh, from somebody up in the northeast corner. Race was ignored. The 1860 Constitution banned emancipation. The 1864 banned black immigration, and now the governor and secretary of state have drawn boundaries to make black votes ineffective. Second point: sovereign immunity. Not until 1874. And now U of A can cheat and not have to pay. <laughs> Any comments from the gallery on this? <laughs> Michael, I love that question. <laughs> it's something It's something that we as researchers uh, on the constitution should do articles. And I nominate you, Michael. <laughs> I will add that there are several good um, Arkansas Historic Quarterly articles and uh, Journal of Southern History articles on the role that race played in these constitutional conventions. Mm -hmm. so there is some great research on it, on that out there. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions from the from the audience? Assembled multitudes. And Jama, do you? You want to toss something into this? <laughs> we have reluctant debutantes in the audience tonight. Well, this has been really fascinating conversation, um, and uh, you know, if there, this is a good opportunity uh, for anyone who has a question to pose to. Dr. Ware, Dr. Goss, or Dr. Harris, this is a great opportunity. Um, so any any other questions this evening? It doesn't have to be on the Constitution. There you go. <laughs> just, just don't ask me about Arkansas basketball. <laughs> I'm just keeping hope alive. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just have a, a comment more than a question. You talked about the constitution and how it gave county governments and especially the county judge much more power mm -hmm. i would say in some counties that translated down to the sheriff since i am a native of conway county yes. um and you know <laughs> it's like henry gray would tell governors no marlin would walk in the judge's office and go what the mm, are you thinking <laughs> you know and um my mother uh mm -hmm. was the county health nurse in conway county for years uh when marlin was sheriff and her office was on third floor the jail was on one end mom's office was on the other and I spent many afternoons in the Conway County Courthouse walk, watching Marlon, you know, <laughs> walk the halls and, and do his deals. And um, so it, it wasn't just the judges that got the power <laughs> with, with that revision to the Constitution. Of course, he also Marlin's... lived down the street from us. And he was the nicest man to me growing up. Mm -hmm. But then when I really studied Arkansas history and studied my local history, it was very enlightening to me. <laughs> and I would go to mom and I'd go, mom, did this really happen? She would go, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> and be like, okay. <laughs> I, I first met Marlon uh, when he was a um, staffer for the Arkansas legislature. You know, his son was in the legislature and he had retired as sheriff. And I, he would sit with me and talk for, you know, as long as I would sit there. And the story after story he had, but the one, the story about him that I like the best is, uh, Ted Boswell's race for governor in 1968, big proponent of constitutional revision. 
And uh, on the night of his campaign, it was clear he was not going to make it into the runoff. And it was like 400 votes from getting in. And uh, so uh, Senator Fulbright's staff was there and Lee Williams was his chief of staff. And so he said, well, I'll call Marlon. We can get 400 votes. Yeah, so we can like get that. 400 votes. <laughs> and so he called Marlon and I was just in a trance, you know, listening to him. And he said, Marlon, uh, what happened to the 400 votes in Conway County? And I don't know what Marlon said to him. And he said, no, 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 I'm not asking you to steal the votes. I just <laughs> want you to bring them in like they were cast. <laughs> God. Well, you know, something I, I'd like to toss in here. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from my office at the, at the State Archives. And about um, 15 feet away through two walls and a very heavy door uh, are the five original constitutions, as well as the Ordinance of Secession from 1861, which apparently, um, I, be I believe Dr. Ferguson found propping up, a, propping up a, um, a table leg down in the basement of the Capitol at one point, or at least that was the story Russell Baker told me years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're not very impressive looking documents, but they're survivors. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing when I tell people that we've got the, the, the original five constitutions here, it's like they go a little slack jawed with wonder. Got them? Can we see them? And sometimes we bring them out under, <laughs> under proper supervision, of course. And the fact of their survival, you know, whatever, whatever their shortcomings as blueprints for governance, the fact of their survival and the fact that they have this link with identifiable times in Arkansas history and with the makers of Arkansas history, um, just it, it's, it, inspires a it inspires a reaction on the part of people that is somewhere like good religion. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's interesting, it's fascinating. Um, and I, I find it very heartening that people reverence these documents, even if they're not quite sure what they what they have in them. Kind of like the federal constitution. Uh, a lot of misunderstanding about it. By God, people will say constitutional rights at the drop of a hat. We've got the real deal over there. And the the other day, I was asked by another state archivist, "Well, what's your what is your disaster plan?" And I said, "The disaster plan boils down to." Grab the constitutions and get the heck out of the building. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I would like to put FEMA's seal of approval on that. <laughs> oh, well, that's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a flood um, disaster to deal with the University of Colorado Library. Mm -hmm. And they were in the process of you know, really restoring it and uh, and, and doing some major uh, construction on it. And a flood came and they had moved all the books into the basement. And so <laughs> you can imagine it flooded out. And so uh, FEMA uh, restoration team was in there and they were trying to figure out what to do. And fortunately decided to call the Library of Congress. And the Library of Congress had had uh, that flooding in, in uh, portions of their library through the years. And the lesson they had learned is that if you freeze dry the books, mm -hmm. then uh, you can actually uh, recover them enough that people can read them and they can you can hold them together. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I did think of one thing I wanted to tell you all about the 1874 Constitution. So Patrick Williams at the U of A was my advisor. And as far as I know, I'm the only PhD student he's ever had. And when I asked him why, he said he I was the first person he thought he could work with. But anyway, <laughs> um, when I set out to do this, I went to find the journal of the Constitutional Convention of 1874. And you can find published editions of all of the other Constitutional Convention journals, pretty much. Mm -hmm. 
and they would bind those in nice leather and so forth. Well, the 1874 group never did have those published. Mm -hmm. It's still in handwritten form. And so the first thing I did is spend two years figuring out what they had handwritten and typing it so that then I could go back and study it. So I'm not even sure how proud they were of it in some ways, is what I always say, because they didn't want to preserve much of a record of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're proud of you, Patrick. That is an awesome task. Well, I, I need to do Very something with that. Point, but, yeah. yeah. Okay, a couple of other questions have come in. Uh, predictions for next session. Oh, this might be a slightly pointed question. <laughs> When will they get back to the business of actually helping our Kansans instead of passing the most restrictive measures this side of Texas? <laughs> Rhetorical or, or actual? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll answer it from a historical standpoint that the legislature has a long history of littering their session with things that are not necessarily pointed at Arkansas voters. <laughs> and that will continue. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. There's and a progressive situation with legislators, state legislators from many states. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's an old saying that my father taught me that he's that hold on to your wallet, son. The legislature's in session. Nobody's life, liberty, or property is sacred. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the the there was the the original version of that quote was on the the wall in Winthrop Rockefeller's office. Okay. And it is a quote from New York State. No man's life, liberty, or property are safe while the legislature is in session. Okay. Yep, that's that's where that comes from then. Yeah. And I have I have a copy of the plaque that he had on the wall. <laughs> One of our uh, political science professors at the University of Arkansas had a saying. And it was uh, uh, something like this. It was like, close the blinds, bring in the women and children, the legislature's in session. <laughs> <laughs> well, these, these days, it's more like the ledge is coming to town, forget your parking place. <laughs> <laughs> Just as devastating in its own way. <laughs> I will say that having the... Um, session every year, I think has prompted more of that sort of stuff mm -hmm. because it gives another opportunity yeah. you know, to meddle. Well, you know, pretty recently, uh, I say pretty recently, uh, when uh, Clinton was governor and uh, Marion Crank was, uh, or when Marion Crank was in the legislature, Mm -hmm. He would tell me about, you know, $100 a month was what he got plus travel. And so there was, there was a great emphasis in the 6970 and the 7980 convention to um, either open that up mm -hmm. so that it could be flexible over time and reflect the economy. But uh, for all those years, it was that restrictive. Well, I remember when I went to work in the Capitol back in 2001. Yeah, and remember then? I, I was astounded to find the legislative salaries were under 14,000. Mm -hmm. um, shoot, that's, that's even lower than curatorial salaries. Right. Um, but happily enough, the men and women of the ledge took care of that problem. <laughs> okay. Well, I um, yes. One one of one of one of one of our loyal listeners says my friend Greg Lading gets popcorn a lot and talks to the Native American statue. I believe in the basement of the Capitol on break just to have someone hear him. <laughs> <laughs> the honest man wanders the basement of the Capitol. <laughs> okay. Well, one, one of our listeners passes on to, to the two of you. When we have hard votes, I want pockets of you guys to take with me for the banter. LOL. <laughs> we'll have a party after this is over. <laughs> you know, that doesn't sound bad. 
You know, it's you're interesting. Trying, you're trying to rush. <laughs> uh, we had a uh, to talk about how we try to institutionalize constitutional revision. We actually had a reunion of the delegates of the 7980 convention and the staff mm -hmm. of the 7980 convention in uh, 2020. And um, well, we decided we'd have another one in 10 years. Mm -hmm. okay. We need to hear the stories from that. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be the keynote speaker, David. <laughs> What is the institutional memory of the state? You've already started <laughs> looking like Dr. Leffler. <laughs> this is just because I have a daughter in college. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who, for my sins, is majoring in classics. <laughs> I will never retire. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't see any more questions pouring in. So I will turn this over to, to my, my mentor, Ann Clements, and my longtime friend, Jama Best, to bring it home. And th thank Kay and Rodney, thank you very much. Like I say, I wish we were sitting around talking. We could probably tell some stories that we don't really want the folks to hear tonight. <laughs> well, thank you, by the way. <laughs> That's right. You've brought it all together, Dave. Well, thank you, uh, David, Kay, and Rodney. This has been such a fun evening. Uh, we've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation that you, you've shared with us tonight. And thank you to everyone who has um, provided uh, comment and questions in our chat. Uh, and we really appreciate you joining us this evening. And thank you so, so very much. Uh, Anne, would you, you have some closing remarks you'd like to share? I just want to echo our thanks, uh, Jaima and mine, the board of the Humanities Council. Uh, Y'all are some of my favorite people, uh, as I mentioned at the at the top of the the program, and really appreciate your time and your effort in leading this discussion about our state's constitutions and you know the governing by amendment that we're that we're stuck with <laughs> with our 1874 constitution um, this series is an important series um, I think we all need to know more about not only the United States Constitution but our Arkansas constitutions and we need to inform not only our teachers and our educators but the general public about the importance of these documents and, and how they affect our daily lives. And I, I think that's the struggle uh, that anybody's gonna have if they call a new constitutional convention is getting the general public interested in why, why do we need to do this? I don't, I don't understand. But I think anybody that picks up a copy of, you know, the Secretary of State's office puts this out um, every time, every couple of years. Uh, this is the 2019 one. So it, it has 99 amendments published in it, Rodney. Um, but there's been a couple more added and they do inserts, you know, as they add them until they publish it again. But anybody that picks this up and sees that half the doc, over half the documents taken up with amendments would hopefully realize why it would be important to revise the document for the benefit of our state. So I appreciate the discussion around that and y'all leading that uh, and educating people about that. Uh, I would also encourage everybody just to visit our website. I always plug the website, www.arkansashumanitiescouncil.org. You can see our events that are coming up and our new initiatives. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jaima. Okay, There's thanks. also a donation button on that Humanities Council website. Just to, yes, yes, there just, is. Just saying. <laughs> yes, and no matter what page you go to, there is a donation button at the top of every one of those pages. Um, but anyway, 
<laughs> but we also offer a number of grant opportunities as well. And we hope that, that uh, you reach out to Ann or anyone of the team on staff if you have questions about any grants or some of our upcoming uh, programs. We have several uh, uh, that are coming up that you will not want to miss. And so uh, please stay in touch. We'll be providing you further information uh, on upcoming uh, presentations and programs. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Stay warm. And again, Kay, Rodney, and David, thank you so very, very much. What a great night.